Hello and welcome to PM Personality Profile. My name is Nana Ansakwa IV, as you know, Chief of the Very Little Republic of Akwamu Edumasa. And I am here, you know, I must say you have to give me a, let me pat myself on the back and you need to give me a pat on my back because the whole of October, as part of Breast Cancer Awareness, we've only interviewed women. And not just women because, you know, they had cover and slate. I'm talking about proper achievers, women who told stories that inspired people. We're still continuing the trend. And I'm particularly, you know, my bias is towards women because they always have to do 10 when a man does one to get recognized. So when a woman achieves something, you know that in the closet they have fought the fight. And I'm here to talk to one such woman who in her own small way has fought her little fight, a little personal passion of injustice, planted seeds all over. Maybe she didn't know, but they then grew up to become fruits worthy to be eaten. And I'm here at the NCCE to talk to the chairman herself, Josephine and Chroma. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. No, not that she grew up with a wooden spoon or they didn't have a shoe and walked from Cape Coast to Accra, no. But all through life, she fought and demanded and persisted that justice would be done. Sold seats, refused to go to classes, and had curriculum change on her behalf. And you know what? It all paid off. This is one story that's going to teach us that stand your ground. Be right, be true to yourself, and stand your ground. When I come back, we are talking to the chairman of the NCCE, Josephine and Cromer. Don't go. Well, hello and welcome back to our favorite part when we get to know our guest. Jocelyn, I always have to start by saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me, Nana. Yes, we will. Great, 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 because I know, I know your schedule, so when you squeeze me in, I don't take it lightly at all. I don't take it lightly at all, so thank you so much. And, uh, but I want to go all the way back to before association. You know, what, what, what was growing up like? Growing up was fun. Mm. It was fun because um, we came from a pretty large extended family, but mm. we we're very close knit. So that allowed us to have so many cousins at home at any given point in time from different generations. Mm. So you had the big and the big cousins that you refer to as brother this and sister this, <laughs> and then our own generation who were on first name basis and of course the much younger ones. Mm -hmm. So growing up you had a, um, a spectrum of individuals that affected our lives mm -hmm. in many ways. But one thing it taught us was that it paid to be persistent, it paid to stand your ground and life was not easy. You had to fight your corner, you had to fight to get what you wanted. But I think it also taught us very invaluable lessons of um, humankind, of sharing, of being there for one another, standing up for what is right, standing up for what is true. And coming from a home with a military background, my father being a naval officer, okay. it also taught you the essence of discipline. It's discipline that was also interspersed with a lot of compassion, which came from my mother and um, a passion to serve with humility as well. So that for me were the values that I grew up with mm. and I think that they have largely molded me to who I am today. Before association, um, I was born in Accra, but mm. my father being a military man, the first two years of my life apparently were lived in Takradi. I have mm. no recollection <laughs> of that at all. Um, and then moved back to Accra mm. when I was two years old. I come from a family of four, so I have three siblings, two I'm, brothers. I'm just interject here and let you continue. Yeah. I mean, girls or ladies admire men in uniform, so I, I wonder how much you admired your dad. Oh, <laughs> I, I just couldn't wait to see my dad walk into Association International School with his staff in his white uniform or sometimes in the light blue and the dark blue. I mean, and everybody, just for your father, I see it, just for your father. And I had this, you know, my heart would swell oh, with dear. pride. That, and I think I'm a bit partial to men in uniform. <laughs> <laughs> a 
and there is your dad, you know. Yes. You know, every woman's first boyfriend. In yes. Uniform. You, can get, you can't go wrong with that. You can't go wrong. <laughs> you can't go wrong. So um, my dad played a huge influence in my life, but I must be honest in saying that early on in life, um, I came from a home where my parents, you know, there was a bit of marital strife. Mm. So we, con we, ha we had that constant tension at home mm. because our parents were arguing or mm -hmm. fighting over one thing or the other. And I think um, one of the defining moments in my life was when my parents divorced. Oh. And for some people, that becomes a negative. But for me, it was a positive because um, that kind of strife made me a little timid Mm. I was unsure of myself at home in the presence of my parents because you never knew when anything was going to explode. Mm. Um, outside of the house, I could be bubbly. I was very intelligent, but I always had that fear of what is going to happen at home. But when my parents finally separated, it was when I actually began to blossom as a young girl. So for me, that kind of um, um, home is not what I wish on any child. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I speak to couples about all the time, that no matter your differences, never ever argue or fight in front of their children because the emotional trauma you put them through, mm -hmm. you can't tell. And oftentimes because we are children or they are children, they are unable to express what they are feeling or what they are going through. But when my parents broke up, it was a turning point in my life. My mother used to ask me, how come you've become such a talkative? And I was like, well, I was thinking to myself, well, I'm not afraid of anything anymore. Mm. So that was good. And it is in those moments when they separated that I actually learned to build a relationship with my father as well. Mm. My mother made sure that despite their differences, it didn't get in the way of the relationship we had to build with our father and I think th those moments is when we learned to draw closer to our father. Yeah. Yes. Well I think that's a lesson there. Yeah. Try and settle your differences away from the children. Certainly. Away from the children. Uh, my last guest was uh, Mrs. D who mm -hmm. happened to be uh, well, the proprietor now and headmistress of uh, association. association. Yes. And uh, she was you know, recollecting about some of the you know big names that went to association uh at two mode yes. uh oh i've forgotten all the names so i'm sure they are watching today that's one of the products of us <laughs> yes yes proud product of, proud association. Product of association. yes but then you were sharp brain as they call it so from class five boom class seven yes from class five the thought um I could try my hands at common entrance at the time. So they skipped class six and took me straight to class seven, which was a little trying for mm. me. Um, I'd never been strong in mathematics, mm -hmm. so that for me was my weakest point. But um, they tried to build me up, and I did as best I could. On hindsight, I must say that at that time, I didn't put in my best. Mm. I really didn't put in my best. I just thought, well, it's really not my time, but hey, if you say I should try my hands at it, I'll do my best and see, I'll do what I can. Mm -hmm. But I think I could have done much better <laughs> in terms of common entrance. <laughs> but nonetheless, it took me to a brilliant school, mm -hmm. Fansman Girls Secondary School, mm -hmm. which was, of Moga, course, Moga Moga. Moga Moga. <laughs> you know Moga. I, I live and breathe Moga. <laughs> yes, yes, you live and breathe Moga. A dynamic, lively group of women. So I went into Enfantsman Girls, very naive, mm. very naive, and I think a little too sheltered. Mm. Simple things like um, cocoa. I didn't understand that cocoa was eating hot because the first time I remember enjoying cocoa, I'd come home from school and the house help had made cocoa and it was in a little bowl. She had, it, it had come out like a mold. So for me, it was like a mousse. And so I thought cocoa was something that was meant to be eating cold like a mousse. And so I'd, they would prepare it for me in the morning and put it in a bowl in the afternoon. I'd turn it out onto a plate and, and scoop it. And I used to just, I go to school, I'm thinking, hey, how are they serving cocoa hot? And one of the girls looked at me and said, how should they serve it? And I said, cold, what is this? 
So I went into school, <laughs> rude awakening. My mother wouldn't let us eat anything from the streets. Mm -hmm. So kenke was not something we ate often. So growing up, I mean, from one, my, the first time my parents visited me, my mother wept because I'd lost so much weight. I wasn't used to the food, but I was having a blast. <laughs> I was having a blast because I told you we came from a really huge family. Mm -hmm. We learned the essence of sharing everything. Mm -hmm. But suddenly you're going to boarding school, your own plate, your own cutlery, your own food. Everything was like mine, mine, mine. Oh, wow, life can be this good. <laughs> so I enjoyed every minute of that, make, meeting new friends and learning that um, Fanti or Chi could be spoken by children because I also thought that fun tea or tree was meant for adults. And so when I went into form one, whenever you spoke tree or fun tea to me, I'll answer in English. And so why do you think you're the only one who can speak English? I was thinking, I can't be an adult. I'm not an adult, I'm a child. Why are these people trying to be adults? We should all just be children and speak English. <laughs> so I quickly learned that everybody could speak fine tea. It didn't mean you had to be a certain age to speak But, but you, under, you understood it, though. Oh, I understood it perfectly, okay. and I could speak it as well. But I just thought oh, no. it was meant for adults. The only person we spoke fancy with was our grandma, mm. who was illiterate, mm -hmm. you know. So my grandma, would, we spoke fancy with her, and we used to laugh at her because my grandma married a Lebanese man. Mm -hmm. And we used to say, what language did you and our grandfather speak? Because you don't speak Arabic and um, you don't speak English. So how did you communicate? And she said, oh, for sure, I'm a <laughs> You know, and we, would, we would tease her no end. So with our grandma, we spoke fancy because it was the only language we could communicate. But I'm sure they had a way of communicating. Oh, apparently my grandfather spoke fluent Fanti uh -huh. and Hausa. Okay. So it wasn't anything, okay. you know. But she, ne she never told us. I mean, she just <laughs> let us wonder and wonder and wonder about that. But she, you know, so I, I went into Fanti's man with that, you know, um, background mm -hmm. of being very sheltered yeah. in, my, in our own space. And um, I think in Form 2, first term mm -hmm. of Form 2, one incident that occurred, and that also shaped my views in life. We had this culture in the school where at the end of term, you would um, shove your class prefect around a little because she probably wrote your name down and you were punished. <laughs> so typically, last day of prep, I just decided, okay, let's, let me arrange this well, how we're going to beat this young girl. <laughs> so I went to my friend, so you put off the light, when you put off the lights, she's sitting this way, so we'll beat her and uh, we'll take it from there. You know, we had um, a lower sixth former in the class, and of course, she was a new student, so total disregard. Senior, senior, senior home, what is she going to add to us? We are, you know, we, we've, we are no longer homo, so I'm from two big girls in the house. So, of course, the bell goes for prep over. And one of my friends turns off the lights and total pandemonium in, in the class. We were screaming, everybody shouting, where is she? We're going to beat her, where is she? And then the lights come on, oh, she's long gone. And so, you know, it was a whole big incident. No big deal for us. Only for the following day to hear that the prefects had taken the matter up with the school authorities and we were going to appear before a disciplinary committee. Oh, wow. And it was going to be a big issue. And that was going to be the last day of assembly. Oh dear. So quickly they set up this committee for us to appear. And the amazing things they said about me, <clears throat> that um, I was a mastermind and ringleader of this act. <laughs> and I had the ability to incite people. Thinking, That's from form two. Form two, like so wow. Like 13. 13, 14, 13 actually, 13. <laughs> I had the ability to incite people. I was thinking, hey, who are they speaking about? Is it Josephine and Chroma? Because before this, you know, all your term reports show how you're well behaved, mm. you do everything right, you follow the rules in school, and all of a sudden this comes out and you're like, ah, what's going on? Anyway, so last day of assembly, they announced Josephine and Chroma, the mastermind and ringleader of the group. Oh my goodness. Four weeks external suspension. So when school reap, that, that was before Boko Haram. That's way before Boko Haram. <laughs> I started my own little, <laughs> my own little Boko Haram, unknown to me. Oh my gosh! So well, school has vacated. 
how do you go home and tell the story to oh your parents? God. That's even worse than uh, the suspension. <laughs> so my uncle picked me up from school, I remember, and I had to go and pick my suspension letter. He was in a hurry. Let's go, let's go. And I said, oh, uncle, I have to pick a letter. He says, what letter? So I don't know. I have to just pick this letter for our parents. <laughs> we got home. And my mother was so excited to see me. My grandma was home and they were hugging and kissing me. And I was very quiet. What's wrong with you? Please have been suspended. <laughs> <laughs> my mother broke out. My grandma, I mean, she had the runs immediately. I mean, because, you know, so you've gone into school. Family and I must off. say that all through primary school, I had held positions of leadership. Mm -hmm. In every class, almost every class, I was school prefect. Mm -hmm. I was seen as a responsible young girl. Mm -hmm. So that is the perception of you. And then you go to school and all of a sudden, you're being branded as this thing that is so alien to what my mother knows her daughter. Chief instigator. Did. Chief instigator. <laughs> so my mother said she didn't believe my story. Maybe there was more to it. They quickly called one of the students in advancement who lived down our road. She came and told my mom the exact same story that this is what happens in school. They don't know why this, uh, there's such a big fuss over this, but all in all, you know, I had been suspended. Long and short of it, I did four weeks at um, home, four weeks of torture. Oh Every God. minute your father comes home to visit you, he'll insult you, your mother, yes, mastermind and ringleader. <laughs> Uncle Shiaze. Well, <laughs> So we go to school, my friends and I, those who put off the lights were given three weeks suspension. Okay. And one of them was actually um, a family friend. Mm -hmm. So we, she also had her share in her home, like I did in my <laughs> home. So we go to school and for the first time, and I think it was the only time when I, I was in Fansman that we wrote a mid-year exam. So we wrote a mid-year exam and we had one week to write exams. So we have missed four weeks of school. We don't have notes. We haven't gone through any teaching. And we have one week to write exams. And I said, nah. Already people look at you, they snigger. Like, yeah, look at them bad, those bad girls. So I said to my friend, Nana Kubi, I said, Nana Kubi, we have something to prove to people that despite the suspension, we can do something good. Hold on, let me take a break here and okay. come back and see because if after four weeks and a week to go to write make exams, what's going to happen? Because this is a you know, sharp brain girl all throughout. But now we're talking four weeks upside down. What then happens? Don't go. Well, thank you very much and welcome back. Well, if you are following, you know, we're talking about the four week suspension. You come to school <laughs> and you have one week to prepare for. Mid, is it mid year? Mid year exam. Exam, which is the first ever. First ever, and I Just think the only I heard, yes. You probably did it because you were home. <laughs> probably. Probably wanted Something to teach personal. me teach me more lessons. <laughs> but how are you going to pass such an exam? So I say to myself, no, I can't have people goading and, you know, you know having one up against me, mm. you know, like, yeah, now we have you where we want you. So I said to my friend, Nana Kobi, Nana Kobi, listen, we have one week to get our notes together, to study and to pass. And we have to make sure that we pass and pass well. So we're going to do our very best. We're going to study really Mining. hard. We will mine. <laughs> Nana Kobi was game for mm -hmm. this. So we used to write our notes together. We got notes of our friends and we would write. You know, I think it, it took us like two days to write all our notes. We barely slept. But we were on a mission, and we used to encourage each other then. Have you written this? No, you have to finish writing this one. Don't sleep, oh, because we're in different houses too. Okay. Don't sleep. Learn. Wake up and learn. She'd say, oh, she won't sleep. She will learn. In the morning, we'll check up on each other. Were you able to learn? Yes. Were you able to learn? Yes. I've learned the subject. I've learned that subject, you know. So we wrote the exams. And that year, and actually, I think that year too was the first time they posted results on the notice board. Mm. And overall, Form 2, Nana Kobi came tops. And then um, somebody followed, and then I was the third. So then it taught me, gosh, it means that if I put my mind to anything wow. and I'm determined, I can make it work. So for me, that was another defining point in my life. It taught me that 
There is nothing that is too difficult. If you have the determination and the willpower, you can do it. And so after that, I gained more confidence in myself. I knew that out of this great challenge, something good had emerged. It had shown me that I had resilience. It had shown me that once I was determined to do something and I set my mind to it, I could do it. And it is something I tell young people all the time that, listen, it is one thing to say, I want to do this, quite another to actually do it. But once you have that determination and you, you have the willpower to do it, nothing can stop you. And so that has also, you know, guided me in my path. And I like that willpower. So I mean, apart from the, you need to back it up with something. Oh, yes. You need to back it up with something. And you need to constantly remind yourself that this is it, but I can do it. Mm. So you, you need to keep telling yourself, and it's the power of the mind over the body. Mm. You know, that if you put your mind to something and you put your heart to it, you can, you can achieve great things. And I think that, like I said, it's not, I don't see myself as unique in that field. Mm. People have done it, but I, I just see myself as a living testament of that, and that is because of what happened in Form 2. Yeah. So that again was a defining moment. So I went through secondary school without any more incidents. No more instigation. No more instigation. <laughs> I, managed to, I managed not to incite any other person, <laughs> and we had an incident-free secondary school education. Mm. Then I, I, right after secondary school, A-level, hmm, the chance the story of chances. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm ill, I go to military hospital with my mum. And whilst we're sitting there waiting to see the doctor, I see a group of young ladies come by, most of them crying. And I realized there were two of them that were my mates in infantsman. So I called them out, I said, what's going on? She said, oh, we've been registered to do military training. I said, military training? Where? I said, look at me that, Military Academy and why, Training why are you School. so excited? They're like, like why, why is this girl there? I said, I want to do some. And they're like, Drusy, military training. I said, yeah, 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 I want to do this. So I quickly go to my mom and I said, mom, mom, military training, I want to do it. My mom said, okay, go ahead. <laughs> now, I had a mother who taught us to be adventurous. So, of course, Coming from this huge family with many boys where mm. you have to fight over the bicycle, you have to fight over everything, how you play chaskele, how high you can <laughs> climb a tree. You know, this for me was another adventure. Mm -hmm. And so I said... But mommy says, oh, go, go oh, ahead. Mommy was all for it. I mean, this, uh, you know, my mother had, had encouraged me, if you want to learn to ride a motorbike, yes, go ahead. So I used to ride a motorbike after a Did level. You? Yes. I just love to ride a motorbike, you wow. know. For me, it was an extension of the bicycle. You could do all manner of tricks on the bicycle. Now you have a motorized bicycle. So what stops you? There's zoom. <laughs> so anyway, um, the lady who was supposed to be taking the girls through their medical screening, mm -hmm. I went up to her and I said, please, can I register to be part of this? Go away, go away. And she wouldn't allow me to. I told my mom, you go on home, I have to sort this out. I pestered this woman from midday till about 6 p.m. Wow. And so all this time, these girls have gone through this. So about 4 o'clock, they've all gone ho home to go and pack and go to report to military academy mm -hmm. and training schools. And this woman would not listen to me. I begged I begged eventually. How, how did they get selected? Is it through national service or? I don't even know how they were selected. I really, we don't mm. know. I think it was random selection. Mm. Yes. So they picked a few schools and then they just picked names. Mm. So um, this woman eventually said, okay, go ahead. Tomorrow, come and do your medical screening and follow up at military academy and training school. So I go home very excited, tell my mom, I'm going to do the screening. And from there, I'm going for military training. So my mom quickly packs my bags for me. The following morning, I get up, go to military hospital. They go. show me where to go to. I do my screening and everything, get back home, pack. My cousin picks us up and straight to military academy and training school for like four months of military training. How long? Four months. 
four months, yes. So we get there. And I remember that I come out of the car and I have this huge grin on my face like, yeah, this is it. This is it. <laughs> Training instructor takes one look at me. He goes, wipe that smile off your face. And I'm like, oh, I was, like, I was thinking, oh, you've come to have a good time. It's okay for me to laugh. Anyway, the first, so that, that will be my first day, but the second day for most of the girls. Mm -hmm. We go for physical training. Mm -hmm. And I am told that, you know, you follow the physical training instructor's movements with his hands. So wherever he points to, you run in that direction. So you're running all over the place. But the previous day, they've told them that when you run and you stop, don't bend over because you can faint. Mm. And I, I, I didn't know this. So typical. I mean, you're so exhausted, you're panting. <gasps> and the first thing I do is bend over. The next thing I remember is they're pouring water all over me. I fainted. <laughs> they carry me to our quarters and the man says, why did you even bother to unpack? You are one of those who will be leaving in a week. And that for me was a challenge. Oh, okay, so this is how he sees it, that I'm not fit because I, I was plump. So she most likely can't make it. So I said, I have everything to prove to these people that I can give my 110 for this. So for me, it was my challenge. Mm. He had thrown a challenge to me. Perhaps if he hadn't thrown that challenge, I may have quit. Mm. I don't know. But just the fact that he had dared to say, you can't do it, I had to prove him wrong that I can do it. And I realized that it was not easy waking up for morning endurance, 4 a.m., running how many miles, doing the steeple chase. It was a nightmare on some days. But then I realized that when I tried to motivate the girls mm -hmm. by singing, it took my mind off my own physical pain. And I was able to endure. I could go further, you know. So I became the de facto cheerleader in the mm. group. And I have a very shrill voice. You know, so in military academy and training schools, as young trainees, we, we used to run everywhere. You don't walk or you a brisk walk, if at all. So everything you do, it goes left, right, left, right. And so I picked up a song on this. So whenever the girl, they say left, right, and the girls have to respond left, right. Some of them are tired, they are weak. They just not into this and left, right, left, right. And so I had to do something to Ginger. So when I say, then they say left, right, and I'll say, I can hear you. Then they'll say left, and I say, why don't you shout louder? You know, so it became a song. And, <laughs> and we used to sing all these funny songs. Don't blame me, oh, I blame myself. I take my long, long pen to write my long, long application. <laughs> and we would sing these songs, and I would lead with the songs. And... After a while, the girls began to appreciate the motivation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I, I, I wouldn't even start a song, they'll say, Josie, say something, you know. <laughs> and we would go on and on. By the time we finished military training, I'd learned the power of motivation. Mm. I realized that in motivating others, you end up motivating yourself. And so I don't underestimate that power. And I don't pass, I don't let that... Um, chance pass me by when you have an opportunity to motivate people, especially mm. the young ones, speak something that encourages people all the time. Mm -hmm. I came up best in weapon handling. I've got my, hey. my, I've got my pictures and my, my prize did, still did there. Shoot? Yes, yes, we used to shoot the AK-47 and two other pistols. Mm. I must say I forget the pistols we shot, we mm. used then, but we used to go on the Teshi range to shoot. And I was a very good Marx, Marx man or Marx woman. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed military. Military training was one of the best times of my life because it showed me that um, my, my fiscal structure did not necessarily bar me from doing certain things. Mm. And if you look at it overall, drill, I was third best. Swimming, I was second best. Wow. And I think it had a lot to do with motivation it had a lot to do again with this mind of a matter mm -hmm. you know if i put my mind to it i can do it yeah. and that you know it used to amaze me we had slim looking 
fat girls who could not do anything. And you would look at them and you'd look at me and you'd wonder, how come she's doing this and you can't do that? But like I said, I think the trick was in the mind and mm -hmm. how you know, I wanted to come out on top of this. So that for me also was another defining moment. But were you hoping to get in the army after? Well, when we finished military training, actually the two IC of maths at the time encouraged me to join the military. And he said, when you go to university, because I knew from very early on that I wanted to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So I knew I was going to university after university, I was going to school of the school of law mm -hmm. so the ghana school of law so for me my path was clearly defined for me and everything i did was aligned to that 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 um dream i had um so when i finished law school no when i finished military training the two ic said you go back to uni do go to uni do law school and when you're ready we, we will take you on because we think you, you've got what it takes to be in the military mm -hmm. and i was so chuffed with myself. Of course, my dad was in the military, so for mm -hmm. me, it was following the mm -hmm. steps of my dad. Um, I finished law school, and my dad said, no, you are not going to the Navy. I was upset. Oh, like, yeah. That is what I want. My mm -hmm. dad said, listen, young girl, you're going into, you're reading law, and then you go into the Navy. Your scope of... Um, practice will be limited to what pertains in the Navy. So if you come out of short service, you would have um, constrained yourself to a very limited aspect of law. And mm -hmm. we don't think, he didn't think that career-wise it was the best mm -hmm. thing for me. I think I saw some, some reason and logic in what he said. So I actually listened to him and then went on to practice law. But you did law in French. Yes. Which is quite unusual because everybody the time, was doing law yes. in Spanish. Yes. So law and French. So I go first year, the University of Ghana, and I pick law, French, and political science. Then I'm told, well, law students who read a language usually read Spanish because the timetable doesn't allow for you to read law and French. It clashes. I said, no, I didn't come here to study Spanish. I came to study law, to study French. I've studied French from primary school. It's, for me, it was just a natural progression to get a degree in French. Mm -hmm. and, you know. So um, they said, well, the timetable is what it is. I said, well, then I'm not going for Spanish classes. So I refused to go for classes. The in, dean... Inciting. Pardon? Inciting. <laughs> inciting. <laughs> I refused to go for class. For Spanish, I think I went a couple of times and I thought this is not what I want. So after that, I thought I'm not going to do this Spanish business. So um, the dean impressed upon me to go and do Spanish, to go and read French. And I said, no, why can't you change the timetable so that I can do French? Well, eventually they called us, they called one day and said, well, you, the, the timetable has been adjusted so you can do law and French. So there were two of us. Who, who carried on with law and French. In fact, um, there were more than two of us. We're about four or six, but we're about six, but I think two of us majored in law and French mm -hmm. and the rest majored in law. So they dropped um, French, mm -hmm. but I combined to my, for my first degree. And you know, I think it was another decision that I never regretted. I mm -hmm. never regretted the fact that I stood my ground and I believed in my French as an asset, as a second language for me mm -hmm. over Spanish. And um, in later years, I think it, I was proven right when I did my master's in law, in maritime law. And um, I used to consult for the International Maritime Organization. And because of my French background, it was always easy for the IMO to ask me to consult in French speaking West Africa. Because okay. I could, you know, I could express okay. myself yeah. in French yeah. and I could, you know, um, 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 conduct workshops and seminars in French. So that always was to my advantage. It gave me an edge over my other colleagues when it came to who to pick as a consultant for some subjects. Okay. And of course, it, I think it also saved the IMO 
um, resources, I mean money, because then they won't have to um, procure the services of an, engage the services of an interpreter mm. when we were, you know, conducting the seminar. So that also really helped me. And today I still pride myself in French as a second language and in um, using it wherever I find it necessary to use. So that also helped me. Yes. It's a, a resilient seed that bear proper fruits. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. yes. So, so do you practice as a lawyer, did you? Yes, I practiced as a lawyer for many years um, before I joined public service. So um, right out of um, law school, I did my national service with the Copyright Administration as a young legal um, officer there. I worked under Mrs. Betty Bold, yeah, Idris. Yeah, copyright. She's yes. done a lot on copyright. Yes, she did a lot on copyright. So it actually piqued my interest in copyright, and I was considering actually going into intellectual property mm. as my specialization. But that was quite short lived because I left um, the copyright administration. Mm. And, um, you know, I wanted to try my hands also at different things. Mm. So at that time, it's the securities exchange laws and the. Um, Ghana Stock Exchange, they were organizing all these courses for securities exchange and I you know, tried my hands at that. So I ran quite a few of those courses mm -hmm. and then was looking to work in that field. And one of the lecturers who used to teach then, um, the late Eko Awono, mm -hmm. who happened to know my father very well, said to me, so what are you doing after your service? And I said, oh, I'm just doing these courses and then I'll put in a few applications. So why don't you come and work? in my chambers, I think we could do with somebody like you. I joined a group of other young ladies and gentlemen there. And um, I did a brief stint with him for about six months and I thought, nah, I wanted, I wanted to move on. So I think um, after I come out, one of my, my career path and um, what molded me to be a lawyer was largely under the late um, Kwekuse. Mm. He had a firm called C and Co. Just before I joined, there used to be Say and Bosman, where he and um, Anna Bosman had run their law firm together. But I joined when it had become Say and Co. They had parted ways then. And <clears throat> Kekuse was an excellent teacher mm -hmm. when it came to teaching young, young lawyers, you know, the ropes of law. He, he taught me a lot in corporate law. He taught us, he gave us a lot of writing skills. Um, um, we had exposure in mining, um, in telecommunications, in ports. It was amazing, it was, you know, and we worked really well with him. The exposure was good. We had a lot of international exposure because we had a lot of international um, clients. Mm -hmm. Many mining firms, you know, consulted mm -hmm. with C and Co. And I think that really was what built my ethics in law. Um, that's what built my, <clears throat> my knowledge of corporate matters. Um, and so I would say I owe a lot of what I know today to mm -hmm. the late Kwekuse. Of course, it also had to do with you um, having that humility to learn. Um, you had others who came and thought they knew their way, then they also lawyers. Mm -hmm. But I found that in humility, one learns a lot. And I was never too shy or embarrassed to say, I didn't know, so could you kindly teach me? Mm -hmm. And he would take mm -hmm. his time to teach you. And if I didn't understand 10 times, I would go back to him 10 times, and 10 times he would take his time to explain everything to me. So Kwekuse did a lot for me in molding me as a, mm -hmm. a young lawyer. So Kwekuse is also, um, let me say, one of, an important person or personality in my life because um, he knew that I wanted to go into the Navy. Mm -hmm. It was, it was one, of the, one of the conversations we would have and he would tease me now and again. So one fine morning as usual, I walk into his office and I go, good morning, sir. <coughs> Excuse me. And he goes, good morning, Josephine. How would you like to go and read Maritime Law? Wow. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Is he a dream come true or yeah. a nightmare coming? Don't go, we're coming back. <laughs> Welcome back and we are talking about persistence, standing your ground and knocking until that door is open. Yes. Well, this is just amazing because you, you've always 
you know, want to be a Navy, that said no. Yes. Uh, here is a lawyer, say, who is yes. a good mentor, yes. comes in and says, do you still want to be in the Navy? Yeah. And he says, you want to do maritime, maritime law. law. And I was like, oh, that won't be bad. You know, yeah. and then he says, okay, th take these forms and fill them and then go and see so, so, and so, and then let's, let's take it on from there. And I'm thinking, ah, that's simple. But it was. Um, at the time, the um, IMO, and still does actually, was encouraging more women in the maritime um, industry. Mm -hmm. And so um, they were giving scholarships to women who were interested in maritime law and other fields in the maritime um, domain. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Say's very good friend happened to be the um, IMO representative for English speaking West Africa, Mr. Owusu Mensa. He was then, he later became the Director General of the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority. Mm -hmm. So um, he said, go and see Mr. Owusu Mensa, because Mr. Owusu Mensa, I think, had asked him if you can give you, recommend a lady lawyer to go and read maritime law. And I just happened to fit Kwekusei's wow. profile. So I went to see Mr. Owusu Mensa, who very kindly assisted me in going through the registration, obtaining the um, scholarship and all that goes with it. And then um, in about a couple of months, I found myself in Malta reading maritime law. Wow. Yeah. So that was, that was also an amazing, you know, journey in, in my life because um, Malta, well, I'm, I'm born and bred Ghanaian, um, done all my education in Ghana, and then, well, go and read maritime law in no other country than Malta. I mean, Malta is known for many, many things, but everything's supposed to be fun, fun, yeah. fun. Yeah. So well, I remember holiday, going to holiday, holiday resort, you know. <laughs> I remember going to Malta the first couple of weeks and having a total blast. I Why mean, not? my and it was... Um, um, a wide range of um, students from different countries, mm -hmm. and most of them were from developing countries. Mm -hmm. So we had people from Nigeria, from um, Ghana, myself, um, from South Africa, from Vietnam, Slovenia, Bulgaria, wow. Lebanon, um, gosh, I can, um, Tuvalu, Vanuatu, some of these countries, I hadn't even heard of them mm -hmm. before. Papua New Guinea, uh, Ethiopia, Zambia, so you can imagine all of us, like Malta becomes one big melting pot mm -hmm. and you're there to exchange ideas, you get to understand different things and different people. And it gave me an appreciation of the differences in culture, but also the tolerance and how to see things from another perspective. Mm -hmm. Typically, the Niger one of the Nigerian guys used to bring their crayfish. Okay. You know, so there was this... Um, young gentleman, he was from, he wasn't from Georgia, I've forgotten where he was from, but he says to me one day, he used to come and eat in my room sometimes. I was kind of the, the go-to lady when you were hungry. My, <laughs> my room always had food because I love to cook. I absolutely love to cook. So he said to me, ah, he used to call me Esumama, which is my Nzema name. Okay. Es, Esumama, why is it that when Hiki cooks, it smells? But when you cook, I can eat. So I said to him, no, it's because of what he's using. He's using the yeah, crayfish, and oh. that has a bit of a smell. But oh, okay. we have something we call Kobe. I didn't bring that. So if I had brought it and I'd used it to cook, you would have that smell. But let me, let me ask you something. You know when we have our, and we used to have cheese and wine parties mm. every week, every month. So when we have the cheese and wine parties, do you see me usually eating your cheese? you know, the really, the blue yeah. vein cheese. He says, no, how could you don't like that one. Why, those ones are really good. I said, yes, you see, the way you can't stand Hickey's fish, that's the way we can stand the cheese. <laughs> literally rotten cheese. Yes, he looked at me, he's like, oh, that's true. I was like, oh, a light bulb just went on here. Uh, and and it was, it's just a, a very small, almost insignificant mm -hmm. conversation, but it actually puts into perspective how we think what what you have 
it's okay. Yeah. But somebody's own is not okay. Mm -hmm. Just because you're not from that culture, yeah. you, you yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and people then began to appreciate the differences in culture. Mm -hmm. And I remember we had um, a gentleman from, he was from um, Mexico, but he lived, I think, in Italy for a long time. And it's almost sacrilegious, apparently, in Italy to cut up your spaghetti. Okay. You know, so you need to, so roll, you need it to up, roll it. You know, it so he he would he would invite us to his room for lunch, and I remember the first time I tried to cut up mine before. You know, he goes, "No, please, please, Joseph." He used to be, "Josefina, please don't do that." Oh, what have I done? Hi, what have I done? He said, "Don't cut up, please, roll it, roll it." <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, these little things like, that define us. You, you always take some, some of these things for, for granted. For granted. And like, look at how he was taken back. You know, then you juxtapose it against simple things like we would take something with the right always and not with the left. The left mm -hmm. was seen as, yeah, you know, you can't yeah. take things with your left. And, you know, so when somebody, was, I was going to give something to him with my left hand, so I'm sorry, my like, why should you be sorry about that? Yeah, and then you that. explain to him that, you know, in our culture, you don't give or take. It's a sign of disrespect. Like, you don't want me to cut up your pasta. <laughs> this is it, you know. So, but just because of time. Yes. Uh, You've been what, two years now in NCC? Yes, oh, yes. I've been um, three years almost. Oh, three years almost. Yes. W would you do it again? Well, I love to serve public. Mm. I think it's always an honor to serve. I mean, I'm saying that because, I mean, personally, mm. I find your office as, you know, one of the most important. Yeah. I mean, I put it next to education because it is in fact it an educational education. yes. institute and you look at how superstition ignorance and people taking advantage of from churches to malabs to this and that and you just know that if maybe they were informed it yeah. would reduce yeah but we have that on one side but our attitude towards this office yeah. or this institution does not reflect its importance. That's what I'm asking. I mean, like, would you do it again? Yes, I think, like I said, it's it's all it's just an it's another challenge for mm. me. I did not envisage to serve public. Mm. You know, I always thought I, I was a private sector girl until I was called to serve, and it it took a long while for me to make up my mind because you you have all this prejudices against a very, very important governance institution of this country. I mean, so important that the framers of the constitution thought that it should be one of the entrenched provisions mm. that set up such an institution to drive our democratic growth. Yeah. And democracy not only in terms of governance proper, but democracy or, or, or civic education more to reorient mindset and reorienting mindset not only in the, the real democratic sphere, mm -hmm. but the everyday things that we do that either make us grow as a country, stagnate or retrogress. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, I think in as much as we have paid service to the importance of NCC in that it's a constitutional body, very important in the affairs of this nation. Successive governments have starved the institution mm -hmm. of growth. And I think it's also reflecting in the kind of mindset and the kind of society we're living now. Because there's very key institution that should educate, that should um, create awareness about what civic mindedness is about, about your role in nation, national development, your, your personal growth being like some, some sort of umbilical cord mm. to the national growth. There's that large disconnect. And so we find ourselves in a country where there's a lot of things going wrong, mm. which has to do with mindset. And for an institution like NCC and since I, I took over the reins of this institution, you, you realize that it's like we are almost an afterthought. But at the same time, the people who accuse us, for me, when they accuse us, it tells me they know 
the role we have to play. Mm -hmm. But now I ask myself, you know that is the role we have to play. To, to play, and you're also aware that successive governments have starved us mm -hmm. of resources to work. So we need to change the narrative. Mm -hmm. Instead of blaming NCC, ask government, demand government to resource NCC because you see the relevance or the tie mm -hmm. between the mindset of the people and national development. Um, we, we have spoken to um, successive administrations on the need to resource NCC, but sadly you don't see it coming. You don't see the resources coming. Could it be because of what you just said, where we channel our anger at you rather than uh, the paying master? Could that, could that be? It could be one of the reasons. So for instance, typically every time the media has engaged me and we say we're going to carry out this advocacy. They say, but you people, you never have money. Where are you going to get the money? Right now I ask them, and what do you do about that for NCC? Mm -hmm. So we are beginning to strategize in our engagement with media because it goes out in the public space mm -hmm. for them to understand that they also have a role to play in ensuring that the resources that NCC needs to lead in advocacy, to lead in engendering civic mindedness is something that is pivotal to the, 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 the national transformation that we all want. But I must say that um, the EU and other development partners, but significantly the EU, have been very helpful mm. in keeping NCC afloat. Wow. Um, at least since I joined the EU, the, sorry, the NCC, mm -hmm. I can say that about 80% of our, most of our advocacy is supported by the EU, wow. which is laudable. The EU, as an international organization, realizes the importance of NCC's work in democratic governance in this country and looks at supporting us in that regard. Mm -hmm. How come our own yeah. does not see this? That is really sad. But I'll be blunt about one thing. Mm -hmm. We have spoken to some politicians who have said pointedly to us that, Madam, why should we resource you? When we resource you, it enlightens the people and that does not inure to our benefit. So perhaps there is a grand scheme to keep us, you know, barely surviving so that, you know, so-called politicians can have their way. But I think that as an institution, we are also evolving and we are beginning to see partnerships with corporate Ghana as important in driving the agenda because corporate Ghana employs a lot more than the government of Ghana does. And um, when they tie their economic growth to the kind of people that they employ. Then they see the connect between NCC and the relevance of NCC's work to what they do. Typically, people are saying, we, oh, NCC has found its voice with vigilantism. Mm -hmm. well, it's not that we found our voice. We always try to speak maybe behind closed doors. But when things are coming to this crescendo, it's important for us to speak up and speak loudly for people to see this is an urgent matter. Let's deal with it now. And um, you, you speak about this matter now and some people want to turn it into anything else. But we all we're saying is we have come so far as a nation, 60 years of independence, 25 years of uninterrupted democratic governance. This is unprecedented south of the Sahara. So Ghana really, all eyes are on us. And these things that we take for granted, thinking, oh, vigilantism is just something that is a phenomenon around elections. No, it is not. It's taking on a new dimension. And if we don't try and arrest the situation, we can find ourselves like the Rwandas, the Cote d'Ivoire. It started like this pockets of insurgents that were not, you know, arrested, that were not contained. They became uncontrollable and they found themselves in civil war. But that is not a path 
we should go. And for NCCU, I think we have a critical role to play in that regard. So there's, there's more strategic alliances that as an institution we need to forge so that with or without government, we can move the people to ensure that they contribute their quota to national development. Whilst there's so much negativity we see around, I think there are real positives in this, in this society. And I'm happy when I see young entrepreneurs making it on the big stage, the global stage. I'm happy when I hear of certain professions, you know, being um, recognized on the, on the global stage. It shows that Ghana has so much to offer, mm -hmm. but you don't need few individuals to do it. A lot more can come from Ghana. I mean, um, Kofi Annan put Ghana on the, on the world stage. Kwame Nkrumah had done that before. Other people are doing it. And we need a lot more of such people who become role models for our younger generation to look up to, to follow and determine what they want to, where they want to go. I think also that as a people, we have forgotten the values that we stand for. 2017, we began a conversation on our values as a nation. What is it that we, we find in, you know, that resonates with us as a people? Which of the values? Today, when you speak of hard work, I don't think it's synonymous with Ghanaian. When you speak of excellence, it is not. When you speak of punctuality, it is not. You know, but these are critical things that drive honesty, in truth. honesty, truth, all of that. Everybody's talking anti-corruption. Oh, let's fight corruption. But I continue to say that until we change or we deliberately, purposefully and intentionally teach our children values, this corruption is going nowhere. All the chaos we see is not going anywhere because we haven't addressed the root cause. The root cause being a lack of a value system being taught to the children. Thank you so much. And I could stay here all day, all year. Maybe I need to come and do a proper NCC interview. But this I think so. was about the personality of Josephine and Krumah. That lady who persisted, stood her ground and demanded that what's right should be done. And if your daughters and your sons are by the television, they're going to walk away with a spirit of persistence so that that door would open for them. But I always give you this number before I go, and it's 024-366-2001. 024-366-2001. Tantees, fashions, they give me my shirts for the show, so give them a call. Girls have a nice shirt. But Josephine, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And wish you Godspeed. Thank you. Thank Until you. next Friday that I come to you with a different personality, have a brilliant week.